Welcome to the Taoist Secrets, The Great Awakening, a podcast by practicing disciples of Taoism at the Temple of Original Simplicity. This is Episode 5. Today, Master Richard Bococo, David Wright, and Peter Lafarge have chosen a selection from The Wisdom of Lao Tzu by Lin Yu Tang. The Tao Te Ching is the second most translated book after the Bible. Because the teachings of the Tao were intended to be transferred personally from master to student, there are many critical nuances and profound doctrines that are often misconstrued, resulting in confused interpretations. This particular translation of the Tao Te Ching was the version that Grand Master Alex Anatole chose to illustrate the great esoteric teachings for over 30 years in his weekly lectures. Lin Yu Tang's grasp of the Tao enabled him to craft an extraordinary translation. Additionally, his pairing of Chuang Tse's relevant parables with each chapter helps to illuminate Lao Tzu's mystic yet pragmatic principles. Here now is David Wright reading chapter 50.3 on page 236 of The Wisdom of Lao Tzu. Those who dream of the banquet wake up to lamentation and sorrow. How do I know that love of life is not a delusion after all? How do I know but that he who dreads death is not as a child who has lost his way and does not know his way home? The Lady Li Chi was the daughter of the frontier officer of Ai. When the Duke of Qin first got her, she wept until the bosom of her dress was drenched with tears. But when she came to the royal residence, shared with the Duke his luxurious couch and ate rich food, she repented of having wept. How then do I know that the dead may repent of having previously clung to life? Those who dream of the banquet wake to lamentation and sorrow. Those who dream of lamentation and sorrow wake to join the hunt. While they dream, they do not know that they are dreaming. Some will even interpret the very dream they are dreaming, and only when they awake do they know it was a dream. By and by comes the great awakening, and then we find out that this life is really a great dream. Fools think that they are awake now and flatter themselves they know. This one is a prince and that one is a shepherd. What narrowness of mind. Confucius and you are both dreams, and I who say you are dreams, I am but a dream myself. This is a paradox. Tomorrow a sage may arise to explain it, but that tomorrow will not be until 10,000 generations have gone by. Yet you may meet him around the corner. We chose this chapter by Chuang Tse, who was a disciple of Lao Tzu, for a specific reason. There's a line in here that was an influence, was an inspiration for the title of this podcast. By and by comes the great awakening. And then we find out that this life is really a great dream. Grandmaster Anatole has gone through this book with us numerous rotations. And when we first went through this 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, that line didn't really jump out at me. It was only recently reading through that line that it really jumped out at me, this by and by comes the great awakening. And as I read it, it was as though I had never read it before. It had always been there, and it was as though I had noticed it for the first time, especially in this chapter, because this chapter, Those Who Dream of the Banquet, is one of the more salient and more popular pieces by Chuang Tse. So there's, there's two meanings to that. Obviously, there's the metaphysical meaning of it, but also there's the, the sense of enlightenment by and by the Great Awakening, the awakening being enlightenment in this life as you slowly and gradually learn something, learn about life's principle, learn about the principles of the Tao and apply them. That is the, the Great Awakening like a, a flower that is blossoming. It's a slow process. Well, that's the point that we were discussing at one stage that Learning and studying and going over this multiple times is a slow process. You don't get it all at once. You don't understand it at the beginning at all, really, even with a good teacher. It's only these multiple rotations over a pretty long period of time that give you a chance to digest it and see how it applies to you and then to see for yourself that this has changed for me, that I interpret this differently, I see it differently, and I think I understand it better than I did the last time around. It's not a one-shot, wow, I have this incredible 
transformative experience. I now understand everything and I'm golden from this point onward. One of the things that we, all of us advanced students, began to notice was that as we were reading through these chapters, they, they took on a, we saw things in a very different light than we had over the past 30 years. Grandmaster Anatole would chew these chapters up for us. We would take several weeks to go through one parable just because we weren't quite grasping the concepts back in the early days. And he would go around the room and ask us after reading it, what do you think? And we would give our response, our answer, our interpretation. More often than not, we missed it by, by quite a mile. Grandmaster Anatole went through the Tao Te Ching, uh, the wisdom of Lao Tzu by Lin Yu Tang, several times with us here in weekly lectures. And it could take as long as a year or two to go through the whole book one time. In the first rotation, we went through the book with the Grandmaster, had the perspective of nature, that nature is a litmus paper for everything in life. And if we have any questions about the operations uh, of reality, we should look to the principles of nature to see a working model of those things. The second rotation that Grandmaster Anatole shared with us in the study of the Tao Te Ching was the perspective of the social structure. Lao Tzu was one of the first philosophers who dealt with the principles of the social structure and how to navigate a social environment and the fact that the values of the social structure are not necessarily the values of the individual. The third rotation that we went through, and it was done after Grandmaster Anatole published the three volumes of the Fox book, was the perspective of the Tao Te Ching from a metaphysical standpoint. In this chapter, with the Lady Li Chi, has a number of metaphysical characteristics to it. So these three rotations create this holistic view of understanding of the principles of Taoism. One from the perspective of the individual in nature, the second from the perspective of the social structure in a social environment, and the third, how the individual sees himself cosmologically in the, the metaphysics of life and death. I think the perspective on life and death is particularly significant. This chapter really requires looking at it from all these different directions because all of them apply. But the Great Awakening, if death is the Great Awakening, then we've tried to understand it from that point of view. And of course, death is the great mystery in the sense that none of us truly know what's going to happen after we die. But the perspective of saying you can't ignore death, I think that is the the single biggest lesson that you take from this, that death is inevitable. And no matter what you're do, willing to do to avoid it, it's still there. Trying to not think about it just sh shortchanges your life. You act as though you're going to live forever, but you're not. And you don't conduct your life in a way that improves it, that, tries to, that you realize that you need to try to pass the test that we've talked about, that you need to try to understand, to study, to prepare yourself. And this chapter really hammers you with it, that uh, this great awakening is coming whether you like it or not. In a sense, we're like a fetus in the womb while we're here in this life. And as a fetus, we think we know what life is all about. We have our thumb that we suck. We have this nutrients that come to us. It's kind of dark in here, but we think we have it all figured out. But then comes that moment of birth where we're, we go through the canal, and that's the Great Awakening there. And it's an entirely different experience. And that's probably what's going to happen when we die, is that it's going to be such a shock, something that is totally unfamiliar to us. The Lady Li Chi is an interesting example of the showcase between life and death. So the Lady Li Chi was afraid of sharing her life with the Duke of Qin. And... And her idea was that she was afraid of the unknown, that unknown aspect of going to live with the Duke and to, and to be there forever. And just because the, her future was unknown with the Duke of Chin, it didn't mean that it was a negative thing. And the analogy is that 
Death is also unknown for all of us, but it doesn't have to be a negative thing. There's another line in the beginning of the parable that says, how do I know that he who dreads death is not as a child who has lost his way and does not know his way home? This particular parable showcases one of the famous principles of death and the sacred Taoist principles of the explanation of death, and that is fear of the unknown. If you can conquer the largest fear in life, the fear of death, then all the other unknown fears in life are subservient to that fear. As Taoist people, we understand that death is not the end. We will transition and go to another place and have another test as part of our life after death. There are certain sacred Taoist principles, one of them being this idea of going home, it's called. And that's exactly this line, that he who dreads death is not as a child who has lost his way and does not know his way home. If we look at the infinite streams of time, we understand that we're only on this earth for a hundred years or less, usually. After we're dead, we're somewhere else. And if we're so concerned about where we are after we're dead, we should be just as concerned about where we are before we're born. So all of that time in the infinite streams of time, before you're born and after you're dead, you're not here on the earthly plane. Since that is so much more time than the paltry hundred years or less that we spend here, Really, this place is more of a foreign place than where we are all that other time. So the concept is that when you die, you go home. You go to a place that's more familiar than this place. And it's an interesting analogy that people cling to the suffering of life here because they can't remember where they were before they were born. And yet this is more of a, of a familiar place than our earthly dimension here. So that's one of the great sacred principles of death is that we are going home and it's not something that we should be afraid of. And that comes directly from the metaphysical references in this chapter. Those who dream of the banquet wake to lamentation and sorrow. Those who dream of lamentation and sorrow wake to join the hunt. That has to do with attitude attitude towards life and attitude towards death. If you have the idea that life is a party, you're just born to party, then that's probably the wrong attitude to take because the results will not be adequate. Even if you have a lot of money your whole life and you have a life of ease, no stress, no pressure, you're not doing your soul any good because you're not taking the test. You're not passing the test. You're not being challenged. You're not being tested. If you have the right attitude and you see that life is a difficult test that you need to pass, that you need to evolve, then when you, when you pass away, you have an, an opportunity to join the hunt. You have an opportunity to go to the next level. Well, certainly the descriptions we have uh, suggest that it won't be, but it's interesting that this is a revolves again around expectations and limitations, that the first uh, dream of the banquet and waking to lamentation and sorrow can equally be applied to the material world around us, that those who expect that life is just a nonstop party are doomed to disappointment because they will suffer reverses, they'll get sick, they'll die, people around them that they love will die, uh, they could suffer serious financial reverses, lots of things can go wrong. Those who dream of lamentation and sorrow wake to join the hunt. Those who expect that life is going to be difficult even when they're dreaming, they wake up to say, all right, I'm going to do my best. Maybe it won't be easy, in fact it won't be easy, but I'm going to try and I know that I have to try and that I want to do my best on this test. And that's a good strong attitude that 
stand you well when things don't go well, as is inevitably going to occur. Yes, you're absolutely right. So uh, this chapter has the underlying tones of the current moment and what happens in reality today. And it also has this metaphysical aspect of life and death. And certainly those who dream of the banquet wake to lamentation and sorrow is a direct correlation to having the right philosophical expectations in life. If you believe that life is a banquet, then you will always be filled with lamentation and sorrow because the struggle of life and the problems that exist every day, the conflicts that happen, they just they go against this principle of the banquet. But conversely, if your expectation is that every day will be filled with struggle and strife, then you wait to join the hunt. Your expectation is correct and you're not depressed or uh, brought down by the fact that you have to struggle and fight on a daily basis to survive. So really, the, those who dream of the banquet and wake to limitation and sorrow is a direct correlation in the present moment to having the right philosophical expectations in life, to not expect a party or a day at the beach every day, but rather to expect some kind of struggle and strife on a daily basis. That's what it is to say that life is a war. It doesn't mean that you're a warmonger and you want to be at war all the time. It just means it's understanding that life is not easy and it's struggle and strife every day. And you have to actively join in that hunt to survive, to navigate the struggle and strife. It's not a banquet and it's not a party. So the correct philosophical expectation in the current moment is really one of the gifts that this chapter can bring. Grandmaster Anatole is fond of pointing out that nobody plans for the worst case. Nobody expects the worst case. Everybody plans and expects for the best case, or at least the good case, that I'll have a great drive to work today, that things will be fine there, that I'll have a fine evening when I go out, that this new thing I bought will be wonderful and it will do just exactly what I want. And that may happen sometimes. Some days it probably will but some days it won't. And if you aren't prepared for, well, the power may go out tonight, if you aren't prepared for my car may break down, if you have absolutely no expectation that these things can even happen to you, you are going to be caught completely off guard and you're going to suffer more because you didn't even make a plan for it. And you can't prepare for every contingency in, in life, but just having your mindset be that of the worst case scenario. You calibrate your mind to be able to deal with the worst case scenario, no matter what it is, even if it's something that you've never seen before, whether it's in your work life, your personal life, just driving down the street and something blows in front of you, an elephant crosses the, your path. As absurd as that sounds, at least if you have the mindset that anything can happen and what do you do in that worst case scenario, you have a better chance, not a guarantee, there's no guarantees, but it get, puts you in a better mindset, a, a more correct mindset to deal with the situation in the moment, that spontaneous moment. Because you can drive yourself insane trying to prepare for every small uh, contingency that may happen. You'll have a house full of batteries and flashlights and tents and canned meat it will drive you insane. So we're not promoting that. It's, it's more of this mental state, though, of being prepared. And obviously there are things that you can prepare for in a realistic sense. Sometimes it's simple things like saying, all right, I think it is going to take me 20 minutes to drive to work today, but I have a big meeting when I get there. So maybe I should leave a little early because something might go wrong. And sure enough, maybe something does. Maybe nothing does and you get there early. But at least if something went wrong, you tried to allow for it. You at least are doing your best to say, all right, life is not going to be perfect. There's also this very interesting and brilliant literary analogy in this chapter about the fact that life is actually a dream state and death is the reality of life. And there's a number of chapters in the Tao Te Ching from Chuangzi that deal with this. Um, there's another one, uh, Chuangzi dreamt he was a butterfly. It's also in this chapter. And he sits down and falls asleep and dreams he's a butterfly. And then when he wakes up, he's, he's in this dream state, as, as all of us have been so many times, 
we are not actually sure what's real. Was the dream state real when you were a butterfly, or is the awaking state real? Chuangzi and Lao Tzu make this analogy with life and death. So is life really the real state, or is death the real state of life after death? The idea, philosophically and from a spiritual evolution standpoint, is that all of life is preparation for death. All of life is an incubation period for your intellect and your soul for after death. So the analogy is that this is just a preparation. This is actually the dream state. And when you die, when you go to, to the place where your transformation happens, this is actually the reality of things, the idea of spiritual evolution. Life after death is not the end. We progress on our test, and eternal life has to do with spiritual life after death, not physical life. A number of Taoist clans dealt with physical immortality, and yet the idea of this chapter is to state that life is a dream state, and we really start our life when we die after death. And the idea that we live immortally through spiritual immortality, not through physical immortality. One of the lines I particularly like in this chapter is that fools think they are awake now and flatter themselves that they know. This is a lesson that occurs multiple times in the book, that the, the wise people recognize they really don't know very much, and they're not sure of just about anything. And it's the foolish people who really think they've got it all figured out and think that they really understand things. And the fact is that we are far too small and too limited and too brief to understand much. So that that kind of confidence that you really know is completely unwarranted. It doesn't matter who you are. I was amu also amused by the, some will even interpret the very dream that they are dreaming because I myself, once or twice in my life, have been dreaming and I knew that I was dreaming. I, but I didn't mean I could make myself wake up from it, but I was actually conversing with someone in the dream about this must be a dream and the other person saying, yeah, that's right. There are a number of principles of death that go with sacred Taoist teachings of death and life after death. And one of them is that at the time of our birth, we're not in control of when we come. And since the master, the, the gods, put us on the string of life, almost like the great puppeteer, they will also take us when it's the right time to go. So the principle is, we're not even in control at the beginning at birth. So we come on time, and hence we go on time. And the gods decide that. The, the fates decide when we're born and when we die. But we're not even in control of these two points from the very beginning. So we shouldn't really worry about it. We come on time, and we go on time. One of the great points in this chapter about the Great Awakening is that... Um, the line says, by and by comes the great awakening, and then we find out that this life is really a great dream. Fools think they are awake now. So that, that's very interesting, the idea that, that life is an incubation for death. So we, we build our postnatal chi, our understanding of life and our experiences, and we try and build experiences that will that will go into our soul that we can use later for as we, as we progress further along the test. It's interesting that fools think that life is the important part and that really this is what's important. And many people, they lose the perspective of life after death in their life. They pursue material things. They pursue career options. All temporary things that will disappear after death. Really, the only things that are everlasting are your intellect and character and soul. And those are the things that we should cultivate. Those are the things that we'll be using when the Great Awakening comes at the time of death. Because those are the only things that you can take with you when you do pass away. As it was communicated to me in a meditation, that is your legacy that you take with you. You know, most people, when they use the term legacy, they're talking about what they leave this material world, whether it's a piece of art or if you're a politician, 
uh, laws you pass. That's your legacy. That's what people will think of you and say about you. And that's the great thing that you've done for other people. However, that's really just stroking your own ego. The Spirit communicated to me that it's important that you do in this life what you are good at and what you should be doing because that is building your legacy for the next life when you pass on. That is the most important thing. That's the purpose of legacy, not this material world. The Grandmaster was explaining to me recently about this idea that the experiences that you accumulate in this life, they go into your soul. And then after you die, the tendencies and talents that you accumulated in life are there. But the memories of the actual experiences are gone. So your tendencies to be able to adapt, your tendencies to have the right expectations and situations, those things, your talents, your instincts, they still are there. But the actual memories of the experiences that created those things are gone. We can all read and write, but we don't have the exact memory of when we first started to learn A, B, C and yet it's in us. We don't have that memory, and it may vaguely recall being in school at that age, but that's about the best we can do. The accumulation, uh, this is what we were talking about in terms of accumulating good things to cultivate your soul, to help you get through the bardo after you die, that you have to have spent a long time usually overcoming your bad habits and overcoming the things that will get in your way when you go there. Maybe you suffer from laziness. Maybe you suffer from procrastination. Maybe you suffer from aversion to trying things that are new. Maybe you shy away from physical challenge. Whatever those things are. Maybe you're cheap. Maybe you're cheap. They, there are a lot of things that you can point at in yourself or that someone will be happy to point out for you that you really don't want in your character and you hope to live long enough that you can help at least partially scrub them out. Maybe you can't get rid of them completely, but you can try to develop new tendencies that will move you in the right direction so that when you're, you don't have your memories, but at least you have the right tendencies later on. Uh, another great principle of death that goes in this chapter in uh, the Tao Te Ching or the wisdom of Lao Tzu is that your body at the end of your life is like an old set of clothes that's discarded. Your soul continues on to the other dimension, but your body stays here like an old set of clothes. It's an interesting analogy that the body is our most personal possession that we have in life. And yet even when we die, our body stays here and we can't take it with us. There's a chapter that's after the, the dream of the banquet that says that human life is short. Human life in the world is but as the form of a white pony flashing across a rock crevice. In the end of this chapter, it really says the body will die, remove its bondage, slip off its skin carcass, where shall the soul of the man go and the body go with it? Is it perhaps on the great journey home? So the idea is that your body will wither and die here and your soul will continue to the other dimension after death. And this is the great journey home. This is where we came from and this is where we're going to. Our earthly stint here is like a hiatus from this spiritual place that we are when we're not here. We shouldn't be afraid of death, and we shouldn't think of it as a negative thing because it's unknown to us. It's where we are before we're born, and it's where we go after we're dead. Even in terms of material possessions, your body is your most personal possession. And even this you can't take on the great journey home. All you can take is your soul, your character, and your intellect. I can only imagine that Chuang Tse chose the butterfly as uh, part of this uh, parable as opposed to some other creature or some other animal because it is a butterfly that is at first a caterpillar and it's in its cocoon where it's going through this this transformation period and then when it comes out it comes out as a different uh, or a transformed uh, uh, creature 
And that's, that's how you can look at this life here on Earth, is that we're in this caterpillar stage in the, in the cocoon, and that when we do die, that we have transformed into something a little bit different than what we were when we first started. Even beyond that, the other aspect of the butterfly that's relevant here is that the butterfly's lifetime is fairly short. Sometimes it's only a few days. Some of them, it can be months, but it's much, much shorter than a human lifespan. And it just emphasizes the transience of life and the importance of focusing on making the improvements to your soul, trying to do as much for yourself, as much cultivation as you can in the relatively brief period that you have available. Death focuses you, just the awareness of death focuses you on that. Excellent point, because we don't have a lot of time. Maybe we have 100 years if we're lucky, but it's really not a lot of time in the big picture. It isn't, and especially for most of us, we don't start from a very early age of saying, well, I need to cultivate myself. If we're fortunate, we encounter a teacher who can tell us, yes, you need to do that. But you may not encounter that until you're in your 30s or even later. And so you even have a shorter time than that to, to make good on your potential. Grandmaster Anatole spoke about this years ago. I remember this from years ago. It was an interesting analogy of the existence of the soul after death. And of course, no one has the exact map and details of what happens to you after death. No one has come back and said, this is exactly what happens. And yet we can see that when a person is alive, there's a spark of life that is inside of them. And when they're dead, the spark of life is gone. If you're a scientist, you can say that the spark of life is some kind of electrical impulse that drives your nerve synapses and makes your heart move. And then when you're dead, this electrical impulse that drives your heart is no longer there. If we follow the rules of physics, energy can never cease to exist. So whether you call it this electrical impulse that drives your heart or whether you call it the soul of the human being, this energy can never cease to exist. It can only go somewhere and change form. So whether you call it the electrical impulse that drives the heart or the soul of the person, at the time of death, the spark no longer exists in the body. It goes somewhere and changes form. Follow the rules of physics. The name of this chapter, chapter 50, is the preserving of life. We have manifestations in the temple here that Grandmaster Anatole got years ago of what we call magic Taoist wands. There are characters on the magic Taoist wands that basically say uh, life with no end. So it doesn't speak of uh, life after death or the immortality of life. The phrase is life with no end. And the idea is that after this physical rotation of life, your soul will go somewhere else. So life with no end speaks to the idea of spiritual immortality, not physical immortality. It's very important to understand that, that we're not trying to exist in the physical dimension forever but rather we want to exist in the metaphysical dimension forever. There were Taoist clans that interpreted things differently and thought that physical immortality was the goal, and they did try to achieve it. As far as we know, they did not succeed. So the preserving of life, the chapter title, is the idea that you, you build your soul and your intellect so you can continue to strive and be tested after death. How to preserve life is to continue into the afterlife with the spiritual immortality, not to preserve your life physically. One of the unique things about this book also is that, apart from its translation, is that Lin Yu Tang did something unique in that he paired up the parables of Zhuangzi with the poetry of, of Lao Tzu. And there are actually some parables that that... Zhuangzi refers to or, or quotes lines from Lao Tzu. I have not seen another translation yeah. like this. Most people, most of the, I think all of the translations I've seen, they're simply translations of Tao Te Ching without 
any Chuang Tse or other authors interspersed with them. And the reinforcement here be, is really nice because the poetry is quite difficult to interpret and you really need a teacher for it. You, you're not going to figure it out on your own. But the uh, prose from Chuang Tse is much more accessible and the combination of the two really is, is a wonderful compliment. Correct, because Lao Tzu takes more of a softer approach towards some of the topics, whereas Chuang Tse takes a harsher look. And usually it's a, a pounding the social structure when he does in his parables. He often does, and yet for both of them, there is humor in here if you know where to look. Some of, the, some of it's really quite funny in spots. In the Taoist tradition that we're in, that your next rotation, wherever it is you go after your death, is not necessarily here. In fact, quite likely it isn't. We've talked about there being so many different dimensions. And it's perfectly plausible, even likely, that your next rotation may be in a completely different dimension. This was one of the reasons for flexibility you know, that we've talked about as developing through meditation and finding yourself in these completely unfamiliar environments is that you need the flexibility to say, I'm in a place where the rules I'm used to don't seem to apply, and I need to figure out what the new ones are, and I need to be able to function in here. Correct. That's why this need for adaptability is so important in this life. Even if the things that you find you're, you're dealing with seem so absurd, chaos, suffering, and absurdity, it's important that you're able to adapt to them so that you can carry that instinct onto the next life. Matter of fact, one thing that can serve you well in this life is experience of other cultures because even then you're in the same dimension, you're dealing with other human beings, but they may have a completely different perspective, customs, everything from you, and having experienced that is a sometimes jolting but often very helpful exercise in flexibility. Grandmaster Anatole explained to us years ago that the Rui, or the magic Taoist wand, had the words on it in Chinese calligraphy, life with no end. And the idea of this expression, life with no end, it denotes uh, spiritual evolution. The idea that you don't physically exist forever, but that your spirit will exist forever in some alternate dimension. So it's the idea of spiritual evolution, that your soul will evolve over time in different places. This particular rotation that we exist on is in this earthly plane. But life with no end means that you have to intellectually and spiritually develop and earn the right to another test in another dimension. And the Ruiz define this with the expression life with no end. Some Taoist clans interpreted this to be physical life, and they tried to, you know, create formulas that would allow Taoist monks to live for, uh, from a legendary aspect, hundreds of years. And yet our clan still believes in this spiritual immortality, not physical immortality. And that's what the Rui defines. The terminology, the Great Awakening, has a correlation with the idea of migrating to the other dimension at the time of death for the ultimate departure there. Grandmaster Anatole's master had said that moving to the other dimension is akin to moving to another town. And in China, that was significant as different provinces spoke different languages and had different cultural aspects. We spoke internally here that the Great Awakening, in a way, is akin to the Great Immigration. And Grandmaster Anatole had explained to us in the past that immigration was probably the most difficult experience of his life, where you leave a culture that you're born into and that you're very comfortable with and accomplished there, and then you move to an environment and to a country where you don't know the language, you don't know the culture, and you can't even read. In effect, you're almost blind and deaf in this culture. You can't read any of the literature or even street signs. The great immigration, it's very similar to this idea when you die. We do visualize these alternate dimensions in meditation, but we've never really been there. So at the time of death, 
when your soul actually flies to the alternate dimension, then you'll have some kind of point of reference for this. The idea is that we exist in a three-dimensional world and understanding. And these alternate dimensions can be fourth, fifth, sixth, ninth, nth dimension places. So they can have infinite dimensions in these alternate spaces. We can't even conceive of anything beyond three dimensions in our world. So the physical laws, these environments, are, are things that we can't even understand. We couldn't even visualize or create a picture of if we wanted to. Adaptation to these environments, the physical laws are different. You may be able to fly there or change form like we do in meditation. And this creates the idea of this great immigration. So at the time of death, it's like immigrating to another place where we don't understand the culture and the nuances in the communication there. And it's something that we need to adapt to. And it can take a significant amount of time and experience to do this. And basically strength of spirit and fortitude. Grandmaster Anatole had a few points he wanted to emphasize regarding the ultimate departure. So anyway, uh, the idea, the, one, of the, one of the most powerful aspects of the, of the death or ultimate departure is that put you not only a different perspective on, on your soul traveling through, through Bard and going to another dimension, but also uh, on this earthy dimension by understanding that death will actually uh, will int <laughs> intercept all the idea of obtaining the goods, material goods. The death will stop it. So during the life, that aspect is very important. During the life in this dimension, we will have totally different attitudes toward material things borrowed everything what we have we borrowed the house apartment where we live we live for a while and then then it will go somewhere else the piece of art which we collect again we enjoy it now but then it will be gone someone else will enjoy it antiques like a beautiful antiques stick holders you know for for uh, silver a friend of mine collected it well, I was from 17th century, and, and uh, he did pass away. His children just sold it, for instance. Uh, somebody collected Netsky, remember? You know, loved it, loved it. After death, you know, they, they sold it very cheaply, children, because they didn't value that. So, idea is that we borrow everything. First of all, life is borrowed, because in the end, this will be death. And uh, during the life, if we understand that all we have is a temporary borrow possession, then we have much easier attitude toward that. We're not going to waste our time, our valuable time, just to collect things. Because it's a temporary possession again. So it's such a powerful concept. Just just brings the right attitude toward life right now on the earthy dimension. And uh, another thing uh, which is important to understand that uh, nobody is equal. So people totally differentiate uh, with aspect of intellect, education, upbringing. And majority of people do not think about those things. They think they live forever, that death is some kind of distant adventure and probably never happen with them. So people with a simplistic, not simplistic, primitive mind, that's why they, they no, not, not, it's not even some kind of uneducated people, it could be educated people, some, some, some uh, rich people who make million dollars and they want to make more million dollars and more million dollars, they want to accumulate wealth and they're becoming to be like a sportsman. They said it's sport. You know, it's a basically, it's a game. It's a gamble game, but in a gamble you can lose. And most important, losing the time, which will never come back. Losing time to accumulate something, 
which is actually borrowed thing, temporary. But the time which people could use to basically to for, for enlightenment, for spiritual development, or simply for themselves. It's, uh, let's not forget that uh, that was in old China, uh, someone who visited uh, the friend could come to the house and uh, the servant could say, well, the master is uh, busy, what is he doing? He's thinking. That's why a lot of times you can see in old paintings the, the sage uh, sitting near a waterfall and just looking at water. You know, in modern time, would we'll say, oh my God, he's a lazy guy. He is just basically uh, have this idle time, wasting it. But in reality, that's only time which we can really use for ourselves, for our thoughts, for our ideas, just to be with ourselves. Instead of, we can, of course, spend time to accumulate things which should be useless. And again, let's not forget another thing which a great writer Bulgakov said, that man is mortal, and the worst of all, mortal unexpectedly. So all this accumulation things, you know, all this, these people who want to accumulate, 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 mining material things, they think death will never come, or come later, later, much later. Uh, it comes unexpectedly fast. And what is that? What's, what soul can think? How, 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 many, how many houses person got? How many cars he owned? Can take it. So basically a waste of time. Thank you once again for listening to our podcast. Taoist Secrets, The Great Awakening. If you wish to learn more about Grandmaster Alex Anatole, Classical Taoism, and the Temple of Original Simplicity, please visit Tao.org. That's T-A-O dot O-R-G. You can also visit our Facebook page at the Center of Traditional Taoist Studies. Please join us for our next episode when we discuss the significance of imagination in the practice of meditation.